Do you have that one friend who seems to know an insufferable amount about a lot of random subjects? The person who chimes in with the odd and sometimes highly disturbing fun fact. Well, my name is Carly, and I am that friend. I often find myself wondering about topics that range from the history of certain holidays to what makes some wines expensive and some a little on the cheaper side. So I make use of that mini supercomputer I carry everywhere and just look it up. Lately, I have decided to share the random knowledge that I acquire with all of you lovely listeners. So welcome to I'm Already Looking It Up. Let's have a drink and learn a thing or two. Hello, hello, and you are listening to I Am Already Looking It Up, the podcast where I, your host, research a random topic and tell you, my lovely listeners, all about it. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi there. Um, so my name is Carly, and uh, if this is your first time listening, hello and welcome. Uh, I love to look up random things and talk about them. And this is actually a pretty special episode because um, it is an episode dedicated to my oldest brother for his birthday. It took a long time. I am like four months behind (laughs) on recording and doing episodes. But um, I, for uh, my family, for this podcast, like to uh, take a topic they want to talk about or hear about or learn more about. And I do some research on it myself. Uh, So the topic that my brother picked was uh, lesser-known mythological creatures. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. I looked up a few of them, got some fun information on them, and I'm excited to share it with you all. Um, If you know anything about me, I am a mythology freak. I love looking at... um, just like gods and goddesses from different pagan religions and understanding like why um they would uh, have these stories a lot of the time you know it's it's interesting to just kind of think about like how they each play into each other and they play into uh, morals and learning about how the world works um and also just you know what people in came up with in in the day with the imaginations and everything so i love to uh talk about mythology i could literally do it all day long um but uh today we're just going to be talking about a few creatures from different mythologies that i think are very rarely talked about um and uh, especially in, in just popular media and everything, I, I think I've heard enough about, like, you know, minotaurs and griffins and all that. And, and I decided to pick some ones from some of the lesser thought about mytho- mythologies. So here we go. Uh, the first one is the Kelpie from uh, Scotland. And this is a very interesting one. I actually do remember some references to this in pop culture, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit once um, I'm done. But uh, I definitely, this is, I love Scottish mythology and um, Celtic mythology in general. I wish I knew a lot more about it than I do. Um, Maybe that's something I'll have to uh, research for an episode. All right, so Kelpies also known as the Scottish Water Horse. They are a um, changing aquatic spirit of Scottish legend. Uh, The name Kelpie is said to be derived from the Scottish Gaelic words, and I'm going to butcher these um, because I actually did at one point try to learn Gaelic. Uh, It's very difficult. (laughs) Um, Not, well, I guess not Gaelic, but uh, Irish. I tried to learn Irish, um, which is a little different, but yeah, it's very, it's difficult. Um, So the Scottish Gaelic words cowpeach or colpack, hopefully I said those somewhat right. If not, I'm so sorry. Please tell me what the correct way to say them. Um, But the words themselves mean heifer or colt. 
they are malevolent spirits, so they're not very nice, um, but they will appear as a tame pony by a riverside in order to attract small children. Uh, once their target climbs on their back, the Kelpie's magical hide will become sticky, trapping the child as the creature drags them down into the river and eats them. However, the horse is not only uh, the form that the Kelpie can take, sometimes they appear as a young woman and lure young men into their death, or they can take the form of hairy humans who wait by the river and jump upon unsuspecting travelers, crushing them to death in their vice-like grip. So, um, I thought this was interesting because I'd always, I knew the, um, horse kind of version a little bit because, um, there's another podcast I list, I used to listen to, um, and I can't remember what it's called right now, but it had talked about the Kelpie as one of its, uh, creatures that it talked about. It was, it was a podcast all about, um, cryptids and creatures and legends and folklore and all that, so, um, they talked a lot about that it had an episode on Kelpie. So I knew that, but then I also remember there is um, a movie <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, I think it I think it was just called The Brothers Grimm. I'm actually going to look this up. Um, but uh, as most of us know, uh, The Brothers Grimm were real people. This obviously wasn't any kind of uh, biography about them. It was uh, definitely a fictional story. Yes, the Brothers Grimm, that's what it was called. Um, but, uh, they were two, two brothers who, um, in real life went around, um, collecting folklore and legend and, uh, in mostly Germany, and I've actually done research on them before. I, um, talked about them in my speech class as part of my, like, informative, speech, so I know a little bit about them. I do find them very fascinating. Um, but originally they were collecting these stories for historical purposes, and then for some reason the book that they produced, um, Grim Fairy Tales, you know, ended up being very well liked by children. So, um, they, uh, became very popular children's stories, which are so much fun, um, to go back and, you know, a lot of these we see in popular media today, like Snow White. Well, I think Snow White is... Snow White is one of them, yeah. Snow White, um, and, uh, I believe Cinderella is one of them. There's a couple, like Red Riding Hood, uh, that are just, like, very popular in media today, and then, uh, sometimes we, uh, see... Uh, the other ones kind of leak out a little bit as well. Uh, but, but, in this movie, funnily enough, there was a creature that was like a Kelpie. And it was weird to, like, it, it was like unlocking a childhood memory when I was listening to this episode about this. Because it, in the movie, there's a little girl, and um, if you've ever seen the movie, basically the plot line is these little girls are going missing from these villages. Um, and the brothers Grimm are trying to figure out why, blah, blah, blah. So, um, this little girl wakes up in the middle of the night. She's hearing this horse, uh, just go insane, basically. And, um, then, uh, she goes to check on it. And as soon as she touches this horse and is petting it, it, it's sticky. Like, she gets stuck to it. Um, and... The horse is able to uh, basically capture her and take her off to the woods, blah, blah, blah. So that's, it's very much like a Kelpie. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but I, I honestly, I was like, oh, that's an interesting, like, idea. So, um, anyway, continuing on our information about Kelpies, uh, they have an array of magical powers, such as being able to summon up floods to sweep travelers into watery graves, um... And they can produce storms or warn of, sorry, warn, warn of approaching storms using uh, wailing and howling. It's said that if you hear it, that's um, what a Kelpie is trying to do. Um, so they have their weak spots. Uh, 
They would only, if one were to find themselves in the clutches of Kelpie, they would only need to get a hold of the Kelpie's bridle and the creature, and the creature, the person, I guess I meant to say, will have command over the Kelpie. Um, they are known to have the strength of 10 horses and the stamina of many more, so they are said to be highly prized when captured. Uh, other ways of killing a Kelpie include shooting it with a silver bullet, which is classic, um, and that will turn it into a pile of squishy mass, um, or holding a cross while saying Christ's name. So, very Christian ways of dealing with that. Um, so, the origins of the Kelpie are believed to be rooted in human sacrifices to water gods, but over time they evolved to become the center of cautionary tales, warning children to stay away from locks and dangerous rivers, or to teach women to be wary of handsome strangers. Some families claim to have um, to have come in contact with Kelpies. One family even believes they have a Kelpie bridal that has been passed down from generation to generation. Kelpies and other water spirits have been the subject of many Scottish and other Celtic cultural folklore and mythology. Um, they're typically seen as dangerous and malevolent creatures, so... That's what I mostly found on the Kelpie. I I love, like I said, I love Scottish and Celtic uh, lore in general. I think this is a very interesting um, take on, like, just using this type of creature as a uh, way to use to caution children about, like, wandering off alone or, um, you know, not trusting strangers and uh, or women to be wary of handsome strangers, which I find funny because it didn't it didn't mention women falling for this. It mentioned men falling for it when the Kelpies transform into beautiful women, but you know that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> uh, so the next one I decided to look at was uh, the Selkie, which is another um, based uh, in Scotland slash Ireland Celtic mermaid. I think I believe it's more Irish. Um, than Scottish, but I could be wrong. Um, oh no, it is, uh, it is more Scottish, okay. Um, and fun fact about me, my cat is actually named after this creature. Um, her name is Selkie, and she, uh, they are seal people, and she kind of looks like she's got the coloring of a, of a little seal, so. Um, but that's not why I named her that, but her name is Selkie, and we love her. She is the bestest girl. Um, so, Selkie, also known as the seal people, are legendary marine creatures most commonly depicted as seals when in the water and as humans when on land. The word Selkie actually comes from the Orcadian, which is a dialect of Scottish word for seal. Though the Selkie do sound like mermaids in some ways, many of the stories depicting them as beautiful young women who come ashore for one reason or another, they are quite different as they fully shapeshift into seals rather than becoming half-human when in the water. Beyond that description um, and several folk tales and stories, there's not much to add about the Selkie, but they are one of the more interesting creatures in Scottish folklore. So um, many of the stories... Uh, I guess I, I should add this because I do know this part off the top of my head, but many of the stories of Selkie are about um, their hides or their skin. So when they come ashore, they are um, they they take off their skin, their seal skin, um, and the idea is they are supposed to hide it uh, whenever they're ashore because if anyone takes it and hides it from them, they're either supposed to, like, belong to that person or um, marry them or something along those lines. Uh, I'm sure there's many different interpretations of it. But, yeah, I always found that very interesting. It is it is different from mermaids. Um, and mermaids in themselves are an interesting thought to me because um, you always want to think mermaids are a lot like sirens from, like, Greek mythology. But actually, if you look at the two, they're kind of different in a lot of ways. And that's something I want to explore a little down the line, um, because I didn't want to talk about mermaids other than talking about Selkie. But uh, I think that is just very interesting how we've, like, 
evolved this interpretation of them to kind of combine uh, these different types of folklore into one thing, which does happen quite often, in uh, especially in pop culture and everything. So um, the next one I picked was of Greek mythology, and it's one I don't get to hear a lot about very often, and Greek mythology is like kind of my shit. So, um, I know a lot about it, <laughs> but this is one that doesn't seem to show up a lot. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to talk about. Uh, and it is the Manticore, or the Bizarre Medieval Beast, which I did find it very interesting that it was, um, it's considered more medieval than Greek, because I always thought it was more Greek, um, which I think, yeah. Uh, so the manticore is a bizarre creature that has mostly been seen in classical and medieval literature and bestiaries, which I love a bestiary. They are so cool. Um, this fearsome hybrid creature was said to have the body of a lion, the head of a man, and the tail of a scorpion that can shoot poison darts. The name is derived from the early Middle Persian word manticora, which means man-eater. And the creature can be traced back to India and Persia, which is now modern-day Iran, and its myth spreads over several centuries. The earliest known mention of the manticore comes from the Greek historian and physician that the shoot I should have looked up how to pronounce that. Satisias, Satisias. Sure, Satisius in his book Indica, which is now lost to time. However, fragments of his work exist in other writings, such as Pliny the Elder's Natural History, which includes a detailed description of the manticore. According to uh, Cestius and Pliny, the manticore has three rows of teeth, the face and ears of a human, and bluish eyes, it also has red fur, the body of a lion, and a tail with stingers, and it sounded like a pipe mixed with a trumpet. It is a creature of great speed and hunts down and eats humans. So yeah, manticore. Scary stuff. Uh, <laughs> I actually love manticores, I think. After I read this, I was like, this is kind of dope. Like, this is a real... Because, like, I, you know, there are monsters in a lot of mythologies, and I think um, a lot of them are very interesting because it's like, what? who came up with this? Or who um, saw something and misinterpreted it as this? Because in, in bestiaries, we find that is often the case. Um, when a mythological and or legendary creature is mentioned in a bestiary as being uh, real, uh, a lot of the time it is, it is a case of mistaken identity. Um, many believe that the manticore's odd appearance is often attributed to its environment, the rugged and barren landscape of the Indian and Middle Eastern deserts. The creature needed to be fierce and have its weapon at its disposal to be able to catch its prey and prevent being caught by predators. At first, the manticore preyed on pigs and mountain goats, then it moved on to livestock and eventually people in villages. The beast would famously leave no trace of its prey behind and had several different ways of subduing its targets, such as attacking up close with its sharp claws or sh shooting them with poisonous darts from its scorpion tail. The stingers are described as being as thick as a rope and one foot in length. Once a stinger has been discharged, another grows in its place. And according to Roman writer Aelian, A-E-L-I-A-N, yeah, Aelian, whatever it hits, it kills with the exception of elephants. Um, and that is in the characteristics of animals. Uh, the manticore became a favorite feature in medieval bestiaries and often appeared as decoration in cathedrals, symbolizing the doom predicting prophet Jeremiah. The manticore has appeared throughout history in many different types of folklore and legends. In modern culture, the manticore continues to appear as a fearsome beast. So not much has changed with the manticore. Um, it's definitely an interesting beast to talk about. Um, it also kind of reminds me of a chimera, because um, chimeras are these monsters with 
well, there's a lot of ways that they're interpreted, but um, my favorite interpretation is the Greek interpretation, where it's um, the... It has a lion head and a goat head, and then the its tail is like a snake. So, yeah. I think that's really cool. But, there you go. The manticore. Uh, definitely not one I hear about a lot. I The last time I saw anything um, with the manticore in it as, like, popular media or anything like that was... Um, oh, it was that Pixar movie about, like modern <laughs> mythology type creatures and everything um now I can't remember what it's called but yeah that that movie so uh and there's a manticore in that but yeah so that's the manticore so the next ones are gonna be kind of short well actually no maybe I'm I'm lying about that I might be yeah okay looking at my notes it's actually kind of long um but I did just like kind of like have to copy and paste some of this because I had been working on the script for so long that I just only had gotten, the only ones I wrote myself <laughs> was the, uh, the Selkie and the Kelpie and the, uh, Manticore. The rest of these, I kind of just, like, went through and copy and pasted it because uh, it wasn't going to be anything that I could, like, really change a lot of it. So, um, the next one is the Baku. Uh, they are Japanese super, supernatural beings that are said to devour nightmares. They originate from the Chinese Mo, according to the Chinese Mo. M-O. Okay. According to legend, they were created by spare pieces that were left over when the gods finished creating all the other animals. They have a long history in Japanese folklore and art and more recently have appeared in manga and anime. I don't know what they've appeared in, though. Um, so that's something maybe to look at. That would be interesting. Uh, the Japanese term baku has two current meanings, referring to both the traditional dream-devouring creature and the Malayan tapir. In recent years, there have been changes in how the baku is depicted. The traditional Japanese nightmare devouring Baku originates in Chinese folklore from the Mo, giant panda, and was familiar in Japan as early as the Muromachi period, the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, Hori Tadeo has described the dream eating abilities attributed to the traditional Baku and relates them to other preventatives against nightmares such as amulets uh yeah such as amulets sorry reading Kali yokai densho database citing a 1957 paper in mizuki also described the dream devouring capabilities of the traditional baku so there's some sources there for that. Um, before its adaptation to the Japanese dream caretaker myth creature, an early 17th century Japanese manuscript of the Sankai Ibutsu describes the Baku as shy Chinese, as a shy, a shy Chinese mythical chimera with the trunk and tusks of an elephant, the ears of a rhinoceros, the tail of a cow, the body of a bear, and the paws of a tiger, which protected against pestilence and evil, although eating nightmares was not included among its abilities. However, in 1971, um, Japanese woodblock illustration in a 19... Sorry, I can't talk. In a 1791, Japanese uh, woodblock illustration... A specifically dream-destroying Baku is depicted with an elephant's head, tusks, and a trunk with horns and tiger's claws. The elephant's head, trunk, tusks are characteristics of the Baku portrayed in classical era Japanese woodblock prints and in shrine, temple, and netsuke carvings. So there you go. It's actually... One that seems a little friendlier than the other ones. I mean, Selkies were not necessarily unfriendly, but the other two, the Manticore and the Kelpie, were definitely more malevolent. I can say words. 
uh, writing the in the Meiji period, Lafcadio Hearn, 1902, described Obaku with very similar attributes that was also able to devour nightmares. Legend has it that a person who wakes up from a bad dream can call out to the Baku. A child having a nightmare in Japan will wake up and repeat three times, Baku-san, come eat my dream. I'm going to do that when I have weird dreams. Uh, see if it works. Legends say that the Baku will come into the child's room and devour the bad dream, allowing the child to go back to sleep peacefully. However, calling to the Baku must be done sparingly, because if he remains hungry after eating one's nightmare, he may also devour their hopes and desires as well, leaving them to live an empty life. Jeez. The Baku can also be summoned for protection from bad dreams prior to falling asleep at night. In the 1910s, it was common for Japanese children to keep a Baku talisman at their bedside. So there you go. That's the Baku. That's interesting because it's got, like, a good and bad. Which, you know, I think most things um, in mythology as far as, like, creatures or just, like, you know, good things also have, like, their downside. Because they're supposed to. Like, the world is supposed to be balanced like that. So, there you go. All right, the next one is another Japanese one, the Nue, which I hope that is how it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm so sorry, and you can scream at me in the comments or wherever. Email me, at me, I don't know. Just, yeah, I I'm doing my best here. <laughs> uh, so, a Nue is a legendary creature found in Japanese folklore. It is described as having the head of a monkey, the body of a raccoon dog, or a tanuki, the legs of a tiger, and a snake for a tail. So, very much like a chimera, except it has, um, it's a little different, uh, that's interesting. According to the legend, a Nui can transform into a black cloud and a fly. Oh, a black cloud and fly, not a fly. My bad. Uh, due to its appearance, it sometimes is referred to as a Japanese chimera. All right, makes sense. Nui are supposed to bring, be bringers of misfortune and illness. According to the tale of Heike, Emperor Ko Konoe, the Emperor of Japan became sick after having terrible nightmares every night, and a dark cloud appeared at 2 o'clock in the morning on the roof of the palace in Kyoto during the summer of 1153. The story says that the samurai Minamoto no Yorimasa staked out the roof one night and fired an arrow into the cloud, out of which fell a dead Nue. Yori, Yorimasu then supposedly sank the body in the Sea of Japan. All right, so very interesting. Um, in a local expansion of the story, the Nui's corpse floated into a certain bay, and the locals, fearing a curse, buried it. The mound, which exists today, is supposed to be this grave. Nui is a word, as a word, appears in the oldest of Japanese literature, early quotes include Kojiki um, and Wamyo Ruijusho due to the usage of man yogana, the Jodai <laughs> Tokushu, oh god, Kana Kanazukai Kanazukai Historical spelling is known to have been Nuye, N-U-Y-E, um, and normally it's spelled N-U-E. At this early time, though it had a diff different semantic meaning, it, is, it referred to a bird known as a white thrush. In the 13th century, Heike Monogatari makes reference to a creature called a Nui, in addition to having the head of a monkey, the body of a tanuki, the paws of a tiger, and the tail of a snake, it has the voice of a white thrush. And around 1535, Zayami wrote a no-song titled Nui dealing with the events described in Heike. Okay, so that's the Nui, which 
is, again, another um, malevolent kind of spirit that uh, is there to cause chaos and destruction, pretty much. So, you know, let chaos reign. Um, pretty cool, though. I, I do enjoy that there is another creature that's very similar to the chimera in Japanese folklore. So... All right, well, next we move on to the Hodag, which, again, I'm not sure I'm, that I'm absolutely pronouncing that correctly, but I'm trying my best. Um, the Hodag uh, is an American is uh, American folklore. Oh, God, I can't read. In American folklore, the Hodag is a fearsome creature resembling a large bullhorned carnivore with a row of thick curved spines down its back. The Hodag was said to be born from the ashes of cremated oxen as the incarnation of the acclimation of abuse the animals had suffered at the hands of their masters. The history of the Hodag is strongly tied to Rhineleder, Wisconsin, where it was claimed to have been discovered. The Hodag has figured prominently in early Paul Bunyan stories, which I don't remember, but I wonder if um, that would be interesting to look into as well. Um, in 1893, newspapers reported the discovery of a hodag in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. The articles claimed the hodag had the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. I wonder how you justify the back of a dinosaur. Because, like, when, I mean, it could be just the back of a lizard. I mean, lizards are kind of dinosaurs, but, you know, it's, it's, that's just, it's very specific, is all I'm saying. Um, the reports were instigated by a well-known Wisconsin land surveyor, a timber cruiser and prankster Eugene Shepard, who rounded up a group of local people to capture the animal. The group reported that they needed to use dynamite to kill the beast. A photograph of, a photograph of the remains of the charred beast was released to the media. It was the fiercest, strangest, and most frightening monster ever to set razor-sharp claws on the earth. It became extinct after its main food source, all white bulldogs, became scarce in the area. That's also very specific. All white bulldogs. All right. Uh, Shepard claimed to have captured another hodag in 1896, and this one was captured alive. According to Shepard's reports, he and several bear wrestlers placed chloroform on the end of a long pole, which they worked into the cave of the creature where it was overcome. He displayed the hodag at the first... Oneida County Fair. Thousands of people came to see it. Um, oh, thousands of people came to see the hodag at the fair or at Shepard's display in a shanty at his house. So he kept it, kept it on display to make money, as I'm betting. Um, having connected wires to it, Shepard would occasionally move the creature, which would typically send the already skittish viewers fleeing the display. Well, that's just, that's not neighborly. Um, the newspapers locally, statewide, and then nationally began picking up the story of the apparently remarkable living creature. A small group of scientists from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. announced that they would be traveling to Rhinelander to inspect the apparent discovery. Their mere announcement spelled the end as Shepard was then forced to admit the hodag was a hoax. The Hodag became the official symbol of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. It is the mascot of Rhinelander High School and lends its name to numerous Rhinelander area businesses and organizations, including the annual musical festival, Hodag County Country Festival. Wonderful. The city of Rhinelander's website calls Rhinelander the home of the Hodag, a larger-than-life fiberglass sculpture of a Hodag created by Tracy Goberville. Gooberville, Goberville, a local artist, resides on the grounds of the Rhinelander Area Chamber of Commerce, where it draws thousands of visitors each year. 
uh, Rhinelander Ice Arena houses two Hodags, one full-body creature just inside the entrance and the other one an oversized head that blows smoke and has red eyes that light up located in the corner of in located in the corner just off the ice which was created by the same artist who designed the who designed and built the chamber hodag so this is a bit like mothman like not um not uh the way it looks but mothman becomes such a big thing in um West Virginia, and I'm blanking, Point Pleasant, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, you know, big tourist thing, um, I've even seen, uh, an episode of, I think it was, did they do it on Unsolved, or they did it, they did it on Unsolved, but, uh, you know, the, Ryan and Shane from Watcher doing, uh, an episode on the Mothman, and, I always thought that was so cute how they had all these, like, little things attributed to this cryptid that, you know, may or may not exist, but the the town really rallies around it, um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure it's, some people believe, some don't, it's a tourism thing, and this is very much like that, where they've taken this story <laughs> and really just embraced it, and it has become a big part of their town and their culture, so that's really cool. Um, I wish I had, I was from a town like that, that had something kind of, kind of cheesy and cryptidy. uh, but alas, I am not, um, but the Hodag, all right, pretty, pretty neat, it, it seems to be more, uh, Native American than anything, but it's really interesting, um, and it doesn't, did I miss where it, like, does it say, like, what it does? Um, no, it's just, oh, it's supposed to, uh, be the incarnation, incarnation, bleh, of the accumulation of abuse the animals had suffered. Okay, so yeah, very interesting. Cool, I like that one. All right, and this one, I believe, is another Native American... American folklore type creature called the hide behind, which this one I read and I was like, wow, that seems so terrifying. <laughs> um, all right. So the hide behind is a nocturnal fearsome creature from American folklore that preys upon humans that wander in the woods and was blamed for the disappearances of early loggers when they failed to return to camp. As its name suggests, the hide behind is said to be able to conceal itself when an observer and sorry, when an, an, an observer attempts to look directly at it, the creature quickly hides behind an object or behind the observer and therefore cannot be directly seen. The hide behind supposedly uses this ability to stalk human prey without being observed and to attack them without warning. Said victims, including lumberjacks and others who frequent the forest, are dragged back to the creature's lair to be devoured. The creature subsists chiefly upon the intestine, intestines intestines of um, its victim and has a severe aversion to alcohol, which is therefore considered a sufficient repellent. Uh, tales of the hide behind may have been used as an explanation of strange noises in the forest at night. Um, early accounts describe hide behinds as large, powerful animals, despite the fact that no one was able to see them. So this one, I find, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it's not, it's not really a creature. I feel like this is more of something of a feeling, because, you know, sometimes you're alone, and, um, I mean, I've never been alone in the woods, thank God, but, um, you're alone, and, uh, it's dark, and it's a little creepy, and you feel like someone is watching you, but you turn and look, and there's no one there. That's, that's the hide behind. That's the thing you're looking for. Um, it's that, it's very, this one's very based in, uh, psychology, and I find that really cool. I love creatures that are more explanations of, of, uh, thoughts and feelings that we may have, um, because like it says, it's never been directly, you know, it's never been observed, which is why it doesn't have, you know, it says it's a large, powerful animal, but again, how, how would you know if you can't see it? So, 
Um, yeah, that one was short, but I liked it. I thought it was a very interesting kind of psychological thing, um, when it comes to cryptids and legends and folklore and everything, so pretty neat. Um, the next one is the Ahul, which is a winged cryptid. Uh, it is sometimes portrayed as a giant bat, while others claim it to be a flying primate. The name Ahul comes from its loud, distinct cry. Ahul. I don't know. That's how it sounds. Good. But, sorry if there, if you can hear, like, um, a bass in the background. My neighbors don't know how to keep their music quiet. Um... It is said to live in the deepest parts of the jungles in Java and can be found across most of Indonesia. Some species can be found on the nearby island of New Guinea in from in form of the Ropen, a presumed cousin of the Ahul. The Ropen has a long snout, large wings, and a thin a long thin crest. The Ahul though has a distinct face face that has features of both chimpanzees and bats, large dark eyes, red-skinned wings, large claws on its forearms. It is covered in, and is covered in gray fur. It is said to have the wingspan of 18 to 28 feet or six to nine meters. That is three to four point times the size of the largest bat known to man, the flying fox. Although it mainly eats local fauna, such as large fish, it will opportunistically, occasionally attack humans, most likely because the creature slash animal is extremely territorial and an optimist, meaning, op sorry, an optimist, <laughs> an opportunist, it's an optimist, <laughs> it's the glass is half full, <laughs> meaning it will attack larger prey when the extremely territorial uh, when ah, when the conditions present themselves one scientist theorized that the creature may be related to another cryptid the kongamato however it's described as more of a bat-like creature than a reptile-like one it may be closely related to the orang bati in 1925 naturalist dr ernest bartels son of nor noted ornithologist or ornithologist not orthonologist i don't know if an ornithologist is a thing um ornithologist meg bart bartell was exploring a waterfall on the slopes of the salic mountains when a giant unknown bat the ahul flew directly over his head in 1927, around 11.30 p.m., Dr. Ernest Bartels encountered the Ahul again. Bartels was laying in bed um, inside his thatched house close to the... Oh, I don't know how to say... That, uh, Jidentchko Jid River? Sure. In Western... That's, that's wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, in Western Java... I know how to say Java. Uh, listening to the sounds of the jungle, Bartels suddenly heard a very different sound coming from almost directly over his hut. This loud and clear cry seemed to utter a hool. There you go. Giant bat. Giant monkey bat. That's kind of terrifying. Um, you know, though, the interesting thing about that is, um, what if that's like a real creature that just hasn't been discovered yet? Because that's entirely possible, especially in the jungle. Like, it might just be really good at hiding. But if it's huge, I guess. I don't know. Maybe, or it's a case of mistaken identity again. Maybe it's just a really big fox bat. <laughs> I don't know. I But I think that would be cool. You know, I like I like the thought of something being mistaken for something. Like I said, I love, I love looking at bestiary stuff um, where they, you know, talk about something and and you're like, oh, that's easily, you know, this animal. Um, or, like, you never would have thought of it being described that way. So, just interesting. Um, so, next we have the Indrik, which is um, from Russian folklore, because I thought, uh, you know, needed to get a little more European uh, references in here. So, um, the Dove Book and Russian Folklore 
in the Dove Book in Russian folklore, the Indric Beast uh, is a fabulous beast. It sounds fabulous. The king of all animals who lives on a mountain known as the Holy Mountain, where no other foot may tread. When it stirs, the earth trembles. The word Indric is a desert, disordered version of the Russian word for unicorn. It is described as a gi- gigantic bull with the legs of a deer, the head of a horse, and an enormous horn on its snout, making it vaguely similar to a rhinoceros. Uh, the Russian folklore creature gives its name to a synonym, synonym of par, para, sir, Parasurathirum? The biggest land mammal ever to live. Okay, so it's just, yeah, that scientific name. Parasurathirum. I don't know. Um, But yeah, so that one is, I remember reading and being like, oh man, that's just like a rhino. But rhinos in Russia, I don't know. Who knows, maybe they just went extinct or something. I don't know. That'd be interesting to uh, look at that a little more. Um, And then here we have the last one. Uh, It's called uh, Nanaue. Yeah. Something like that. Um, Some people will recognize this one because this one actually is uh, common in popular culture for um, anyone who is a DC Comics fan will know. Um, I probably said the name wrong, so I, I'm sorry. Um, Nanaue is the son of Kamohoali, probably said that wrong too, who is the king of sharks. He was born with a shark's mouth on his back. As a boy, Nanaue, Nanaue, I don't know. His mother, uh, Kali, told him, or Kale, told him to never eat meat as it would give him a craving for flesh. However, when he turned seven years old, he ate meat and began to crave human flesh. He took up residence in Kanaina Cave, where he would leave human bodies to rot before eating them as he found rotted flesh to be the tastiest. Ew. That's just, that's just gross. Um... When Nana Nue was a man, Umi e Lioa, the king of Hawaii, of Hawaii, I know how to say Hawaii, issued an order for all men, for all men to till a large plantation for the king. When Nana Nue worked, others worked, others worked. Other workers took off his clothing, revealing his shark mouth on his back. He bit many of the other men, and the king deduced that Nanue was responsible for the disappearances of humans into the Kanaina cave. The king had Nanue, I'm so butchering this, tied to a stake and burned alive. But Nanawe prayed for, to his father and escaped, shape shifting into a shark to swim away. Um, he swam from the island of Hawaii to Maui. Then he married the sister of the chief and tried to stop his habit of eating people, but fell to temptation and resumed his activities. He was caught in the act and once again fled this time to Malo- Malokai. And there he was caught once again and captured in nets. The people of Molokai prayed to the demigod Unahua, who burned Nanue alive. Okay, sorry for butchering all of those words. I feel really bad. Uh, So this is um, definitely uh, Hawaiian slash Samoan. Not 100% sure, but there you go. That's the story. Uh, And in uh, D.C., I believe, if I'm correct, um, this is King Shark's real name, is not Nanue, it's what he's based off of, except he's, like, literally got just, like, the head of a shark and the body of a man, so, pretty neat. Or he's just a big shark on two feet, one of the two. Something like that. There's, I don't know, he's a land-walking shark, man. He likes to eat people. 
what I know, but anyway, um, so yeah, I, uh, find all these very interesting. They were fun to talk about, fun to learn a little about, um, but yeah, that's all I have for today. Uh, I definitely really enjoyed, enjoyed these. I think if I had to pick a favorite, I'd obviously want to say Selkie just because I already knew enough about it. Um, but other than the Selkie, I think the Hodag was cool just because of its, uh, connection to the town, um, in, uh, Wisconsin. So, I wonder if, uh, I wonder what, what that town is like. I, I should look it up and see. Um, but anyway, that is where we're gonna leave it for today. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen, and if you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, share it. It really helps me out. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Bye! Thank you for listening to I'm Already Looking It Up. If you're enjoying the podcast, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to my Patreon at patreon.com slash wildforestproductions. Don't forget to check out all the social links below. Thank you.